All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kari Wolf. I'm the chair of psychiatry here at SIU School of Medicine. And welcome to our third talk, third of six talks related to opioid prescribing. This is from a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health, um, one of many initiatives to really uh, try to address the opioid epidemic. This particular grant is related to education programs. So we appreciate you being here today. Um, we have a tremendous speaker lined up. Let me do a few housekeeping things first. So um, please, everyone be sure that you signed in on the sign-in sheet. And um, we were asked to see the CME office to please be sure that you write very clearly. They're going to need to email you for you to be able to receive your CME credit. So it's important that they can read your writing. Um, also, none of the planners or speakers have any relevant financial relationships to disclose related to this talk or the grant in general. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Sarah Kamal Robertson. She is a, pharmacolog or a pharmacist uh, who has expertise in pain management and opioids. And in fact, her current role, um, she is serving as a Detailer, which means that she is recognized for her level of knowledge in this space and going around and helping train uh, primary care providers as well as others on appropriate use of opioids. Um, so we are very pleased that she's going to be presenting today on the pharmacology of pain, opioids, and beyond. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just, before I, I really get into the pharmacology, um, you have some quick learning objectives, but uh, really what I want to say is that I think with um, pain management, we really need to um, set goals with our patients and help them to realize that it's um, medication may help with 30% of the pain relief that they can experience. So they need to understand up front that we, we can't fix it with a pill. Um, and unfortunately, I think we're kind of in that generation of let's take a pill to fix something, kind of like with diabetes, let me just take something instead of, of change my lifestyle or change my eating. So uh, just to, to realize that, you know, medication alone is not going to be the total part of their um, uh, whole treatment plan as far as trying to, when we're dealing with chronic pain, I should say. So number one goal we really need to be looking at is helping them fo focus on function and increasing the, the, uh, the function that they have, their quality of life, helping them to restore their physical and emotional and social function so that they can reconnect with what's important to them. Um, you know, help them to uh, realize that they need to be a part of this process uh, to improve their, you know, own ability to help manage their chronic condition. And then, of course, if there's any um, underlying body tissue injuries, we're addressing those. So, non-pharmacologic management, um, self-management is the is the key, is the foundation of the, of having quality pain control to realize they they've got to be an active partner in this and not just try and rely on the medication alone. Uh, we've got a lot of different things that we can we can try, but that's never going to take care of everything. Um, and, and it's a, a, a change in mindset, so it's kind of resetting uh, the expectation to the patient. So I'm not real good with um, technology, so what I had seen of this is actually a very pretty nice little circle in, in forts, um, and this is my recreation of this. But it's just kind of showing you that um, the different components of what needs to be involved. So besides just the medications, which is just one portion, is the physical. So there, you know, the, the new CDC guidelines, well, they're not extremely new anymore, but they've been out for a couple of years. So general exercise, so things like yoga and tai chi, the manual therapies, the TENS units, but this is just a nice little representation along with the, the psycho, psycho behavioral um, aspects of doing CBT for pain, for insomnia, things that are also contributing to their condition. And then, you know, if appropriate, then maybe some of the procedural things. So. The way that I kind of set up my presentation is just to, to kind of mimic the, um, the CDC guidelines as far as what they're recommending first line now. So it's no longer do they recommend opio opioids as first line therapy. So that's where I'm going to start with what their recommendations and kind of go that way. Um, so acetaminophen, the, the non-steroidals, the NSAIDs, antidepressants, you know, selective ones, convulsants, muscle relaxants, and then some topical therapy. And so with the um, acetaminophen, it's been around for a really long time, relatively safe and inexpensive 
works good for fevers, for analgesia, uh, doesn't have any of the anti-inflammatory properties, so um, it's often combined with other medications, uh, you know, with some of the opioids. Uh, remember not to exceed 4,000 milligrams, and as a pharmacist, I'm always counseling, whenever I work in the community, so I'm always counseling people on this, because so many of our cough and cold preparations are multi-symptom, and they have the, the, the acetaminophen in it. So making sure if we are prescribing this, whether it's acetaminophen by itself or if it's acetaminophen mixed in with um, something like the hydrocodone or the oxycodone, that we are um, talking to the patients about pay attention to what you're getting if you've got a seasonal allergies, colds, that you're, you know, kind of stay away from the multi-symptom uh, ingredients. Um, and then if, if they uh, have some liver disease or they're drinking quite a bit of alcohol, we need to go lower than that 4,000 and maybe look at 2,000 milligrams a day. So the NSAIDs, I'm not going to go, there's so many of these, I'm not going through each and every one of them. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the big things though, um, they have the analgesic effect, they've got the antipyretic and the anti-inflammatory. Um, what, what my experience has been is that if you've tried one, you've tried one, that it's, it can be very individualized. So if it's appropriate for your patient, and this is a good first line inexpensive option, and they say, this isn't helping, what else have you got for me? Try a different one. Sometimes you might try two or three. Um, personally, I can tell you, you know, over the counter ibuprofen girl here, but the uh, naproxen doesn't do much for me. So it's very patient specific. So one person likes one thing or works better for them than another. So don't just give up after one, uh, try something different. And we've got a lot of options out there. Uh, salsalate is an older one, but it's, it's, it's better for, um, you know, some of the side effects of that are a little bit nicer for the uh, geriatric population. Um, but do think about um, the uh, risk for GI, and if, it, if it's appropriate, um, get them on a PPI or an H2 blocker if they need it. Um, that might be if they've got a history of ulcers, a higher dose, higher age, if they're on aspirin therapy, which you want to separate from the dose and time, and, and then an anticoagulant too. So. Um, some other tidbits about these, avoid patients that already have coronary artery disease. If they've got renal dysfunction, this kind of limits. Uh, we're not able to use it. CHF, um, risk factors. Talk louder. Okay. Better? Okay. So um, with the risk factor, or the risks include uh, cardiovascular, uh, MI, hypertension, GI ulceration, heart failure, exacerbation, um, bleeding. So, uh, if you prescribe these, make sure that you're talking to the patients about things to watch for. Um, and then the also, again, like the acetaminophen, don't, make sure that they're not taking additional um, over-the-counter NSAIDs. So, you know, they might think, well, I've got Mobic, Meloxicam, or I've got Celebrex, you know, but I've got a headache now, so I'm going to take some ibuprofen. Well, we don't want to do that because that's increasing their risk for having some adverse outcomes. Um, in our patients that maybe uh, an NSAID might be beneficial for, but they can't tolerate it for um, kidney reasons or something else, we might be able to use a topical depending upon what they've got, what their pain is. So um, we've got the topical NSAIDs that have less absorption, um, have to be more of a, a localized pain. But again, you don't want to use additional NSAIDs with those. So with this one, um, I will talk a little bit about this topic, specific topic. So we've got the diclofenac gel. It's probably the most commonly used, but it comes with a solution or a patch. To, um, it's approved for osteoarthritis. Um, uh, the patch is also approved for acute pain uh, due to minor uh, strains, sprains, and contusions. And it's, uh, they're really nice. They come with a little card inside that shows you, okay, this is four grams. You don't want to make sure your patient doesn't just take this and like the you know, some aspirin cream or something, just rub it on, you know, they need to measure it out and uh, not just rub it wherever. So it's uh, four grams for lower, two grams for upper body joints uh, with a maximum of 32 grams a day. So. Adge anal analgesic adjuvants. So these might help reduce some of the reliance on opioids. Uh, they can reduce the poor pain outcomes because we need to make sure that we're treating pain with the appropriate medication. Uh, so things like this are thinking more of your nerve pain. So the tricyclics, the uh, TCA antidepressants, uh, SNRIs, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, some of the anticonvulsants, muscle relaxants, those are typically going to be more short-term unless you've got a spasticity 
type condition going on, and then some additional topicals. So with the tricyclics or the TCAs, this is an off-label indication. Amitriptyline, nortriptyline have probably been studied the most. You want to start with a low dose and start at bedtime. These do cause some drowsiness and sedation, so that's one of the side effects that can be beneficial, because oftentimes people with pain have trouble sleeping. If they've got some depression going on, then we might have one pill that's treating three things, and then we're producing some polypharmacy, which is always a good thing. But start low, titrate every couple of weeks. Adequate trial would be considered six to eight weeks. They're anticholinergic, the amitriptyline more so than the nortriptyline, the secondary amines. So watching for some of those types of things, drowsiness, confusion, the orthostatic hypotension, dry mouth. Make sure that you tell them, especially if they're a little bit older, that if you are getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, be careful. Steady yourself before you take off walking. They can be useful for neuropathic pain. They're good for migraine prevention. Some of the monitoring things that you want to look at, blood pressure. Maybe if they're older or they have additional risk factors, you might want to get an ECG first and monitor their electrolytes. So then we've got a couple of SNRIs that are helpful. Duloxetine actually has FDA approval for some conditions, and it's going to start with 30 milligrams a day for seven days and then increase to 60. You do have to make sure that you're dose adjusting if they've got a hepatic impairment or low kidney function. Adverse effects, sedation, nausea, constipation are some of the more common. You want to try eight to 12 weeks on this one for an adequate trial. They might notice some benefit in pain reduction after about a week. Your FDA approved conditions here, fibromyalgia, chronic musculoskeletal pain. So this could be something that might be helpful in back pain too, which we know that's a big thing that we hear is I've got low back pain. In addition, if they've got anxiety and depression, then it might be treating something, you know, again, two birds with one stone. So monitor for blood pressure. It's not as bad as the venlafaxine, but it can increase your blood pressure. And then watch for changes in mood. So worsening of depression, changes in just how they're acting, increase in anxiety. Venlafaxine is considered off-label, and it's not got as much support as the duloxetine does. You do have to get up to a little bit higher dose before you get the norepinephrine in there. So you're going to start with 75 again, something that you're going to titrate up on, but you want to get to at least 150 milligrams before you're really going to start seeing the benefits of that. It does require the same dose adjustments for hepatic and renal. Side effects similar, nausea, dizziness, drowsiness, hypertension need to be a little bit more watchful for. Adequate trial six to eight weeks. Monitor blood pressure, changes in mood, worsening in symptoms. With any of the antidepressants, you also want to talk to, especially if you're giving them something else, maybe you're giving them some tramadol, to just caution about serotonin syndrome so that they're aware of what kind of symptoms to look for if they start feeling a little bit different, you know, restless or they're agitated, anxiety, diarrhea, start running a fever, they're confused, make sure that they know what to look for. They're just aware of that to have in the back of their mind if they start feeling a little bit different. So with the anticonvulsants, there's really two that have been studied a little bit more and shown to be of benefit. For gabapentin, which is, it's cheaper, so that's typically what people are going to try. Insurance likes to pay for that one a little bit better. It is considered off-label. Excuse me. Initiate with 100 or 300 at that time and increase every one to seven days as tolerated until pain relief, but we've got a max of about 3,600 with that. It does require dose adjusting for renal impairment. Usually, depending on the degree, you might be able to get up to 1,400 and they're going to split that in two doses versus three or four. Adverse effects, CNS depression, dizziness, drowsiness, peripheral edema, so they might have some lower extremity swelling. Big thing about this is do titrate slowly and don't forget to tell your patients that. It's very important, especially if you've got somebody a little bit older. I think I've got this, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think I've got this in another slide. It is a controlled substance now in Kentucky. 
So it, is, it does have a potential for abuse, and what they're doing is taking a bunch of it at one time. They get a high, they feel like they're drunk, and they're all happy. So uh, we want to, um, you know, we don't want somebody that's trying to get this for pain relief to be turned off by the medication because they feel too lucky to take it. So start low, go slow, um, try to get them to titrate to an adequate dose, maintain it for a couple of weeks at that dose before we say, is it working or not? Um, want to monitor periodic renal function because it is something that does need to be dosed, adjusted, and monitor for changes in mood and substance abuse. Um, it, this one, because it can cause a drowsiness, might be, again, something useful for insomnia. Sometimes having a higher dose at bedtime versus the rest of the day might help with that. So pregabalin, or um, since this one's still brand name, sometimes the insurance is going to want people to try the gabapentin before they try the pregabalin. If they've gotten maybe but not really a whole lot of benefit from the pregabalin or the gabapentin, then it, it makes it a little bit easier sometimes to get the insurance to pay for it. Since I still work in community pharmacy every once in a while, I try to, to throw those things out there because you guys don't always necessarily realize that. You get a request and say, I need a prior authorization for this. So, um, initiate with 50 to 75. If you've got somebody that's super sensitive um, and tells you that up front, uh, you can start with a 25. They do make a 25 milligram capsule. Um, depending upon the indication, it's going to be two or three times a day. Um, max dose of 450, and that's going to be divided up. Uh, does require the renal adjustment, uh, drowsiness, dizziness, peripheral edema are some of the more common side effects. Adequate trial of about four weeks after you get into a good dose. Um, same type of monitoring as the gabapentin, periodic renal function, uh, watch for weight gain or edema, um, and then up the degree of sedation, if they're a little bit more tired, and then changes in mood. So just in general, for anticonvulsants, some additional precautions. Um, they are, you know, originally they were for seizures, and we're going to try to use them for pain here, but abruptly stopping them. <laughs> uh, because there is a, an increased risk of seizures, so you want to taper off if they decide it's not going to work. Um, especially if you're combining with there is an increased risk of respiratory depression. So something to keep in mind. Um, not as bad as a vasopine, but it is something that is going to have an increased risk of depression. Uh, we're talking about the gabapentin, but, and again, start slow, go slowly, start low and go slow, especially in the elderly. We don't want to have them have a fall or something to begin with. So, um, muscle relaxers. These are something that we would probably use, um, Short term, but it is something that I just wanted to throw out there. Um, they cause varying degrees of uh, sedation. <laughs> the varying degrees of sedation are anticholinergic properties, but drowsiness and dizziness. Um, another thing that you want to make sure if they're trying to work still, they need to check this out and see they're going to how they're going to react to it before they start trying to. Uh, be focused at work or especially operating heavy machinery. Um, you want to try and use the lowest effective dose. Uh, Diazepam, I know at one time was used for a muscle relaxer, and I've still seen some physicians in the, not so much in our area, but use this. If we're given opioids, we definitely don't want to use this as a muscle relaxer. We've got other options that are going to be less risky, so uh, try to avoid that. Uh, and one thing about the carisoprodol, um, that does metabolize to a benzodiazepine. So if you have a patient that's been on it for a while and you decide, let's just get you off this and see how you do, um, it's not something that you want to abruptly stop because they can have, they could have withdrawal symptoms from that. So moving on to topicals, just some tips and tricks on that. Don't apply to broken or irritated skin. You don't want to, uh, occlusion of the skin is going to, um, or heat a change how it's absorbed, so that could cause some serious side effects. Uh, large amounts of topical uh, preparations increase the risk for systemic toxicity. Uh, so if you go and look at lidocaine, this is approved for neuropathic pain. Uh, the 4% can be used up to four times a day if you're trying a cream or an ointment. Uh, the lidocaine patch, 5%, uh, you can apply up to three patches for 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, there is an OTC available. I think it's maybe the Aspercream is like a 4% little patch. So 
there are even some over-the-counters out there if insurance is being finicky just to see if it gives the patient some relief, whether it would be worth trying to get the insurance to pay for it. Capsaicin, so musculoskeletal or neuropathic pain, it might take a full few weeks for this to get the full effect. They do need to remember to apply it routinely throughout the day, not just once in a while to really get the benefit. Advice to wear gloves or wash hands immediately after applying. Be very careful about touching mucous membranes, even if you think you've washed your hands good, because if anybody's ever done it or cut up some hot peppers and you touch your eyes or your mouth, it does burn. It may cause some burning or tingling. It's just they're getting used to how they're using it, and they should stop it if they've got any severe burning or itching that's not being relieved. So classes of opioids. So we get to the big guns. I broke these down in classes just for one little tidbit. If you're doing urine drug screens, and that's a whole other topic, but if you're doing urine drug screens, sometimes what you're screening for may or may not show up on it. Your natural from the opium, those are going to show up on your urine drug screen. Typically your semi-synthetics will. Buprenorphine typically doesn't. But the synthetic, if you're checking those and you want to make sure the patient's taking it, that's typically a different test. So just be aware and don't think your patient may or may not be taking something, because if they're prescribed methadone and it doesn't show up on the urine drug screen, it could be the screen that you're using. So that's something that you would want to know with your own lab, and just to be aware of that. That's the only reason I broke it down that way, just for that little tidbit of info. So the codeine, low potency, it's good for antitussive properties. Duration of action, four to six hours. It does, it's a prodrug, so it does have to be converted to be active. So we're looking at the CYP2D6. And there is variations in how people metabolize through this enzyme. So you could have some ultra-rapid metabolizers, those are slow metabolizers, so you could have a buildup and have some toxicity going on. It may accumulate then in renal dysfunction, because we do have the toxic metabolites, and it's caution in the elderly, probably not one of the better choices. Morphine, and that's what codeine breaks it down into, it's kind of the gold standard, and it's what we, whenever we start comparing other pain medications, we often do it in morphine equivalents. That's what we break things down at. So multiple formulations of this, short-acting, long-acting, IV, IM, sub-Q, so it can be given in many different ways. The oral versus the IV or the sub-Q, it's not milligram for milligram. There are specific conversions, so that's just something to be aware of. Five milligrams of oral is not the same as five milligrams IV. Duration of action is going to be a little bit different for each form. The adverse drug events, those are going to be pretty much common and similar through all these, so I don't have it on every slide. But the nausea or vomiting early on, you know, hopefully they can overcome that if they're experiencing that, if it's something they need to be on for a while. Respiratory depression, they're never going to, that's not something that you ever develop a tolerance to. It's always got to be a concern. Constipation, they need to be on a prophylactic bowel regimen. And then itching, again, if you're developing that with it, probably need to try a different medication. We've got two major toxic metabolites with that, so again, caution with the renal dysfunction is not one that you want to use. And again, you know, be careful with the elderly. So semi-synthetic hydrocodone, often paired with acetaminophen. It is the parent compound and does have an active metabolite. It converts into hydromorphone, same way, 2D6. So speaking of that, there are some medications that can affect how this is metabolized that might be commonly used. Things like bupropion or paroxetine, solicoxib, those are things that can affect the metabolism, so just something to be aware of. Tablet liquid, there is an extended release single agent product out now. I don't know how much it's actually being prescribed without the Tylenol or the acetaminophen in it, and I think that was more for 
supposedly um, we're never more concerned about liver issues, and so that was the, the reasoning for the single ingredient, and those are an extended release. Um, so the duration of action for immediate release, four to eight hours, uh, 24 hours for the extended. Um, it's pretty much equivalent morphine, or milligram to milligram for morphine. So I, I, after listening to one of the other talks, I realized um, somebody said, you know, some of these medications work out whenever I was in medical school. And so it's hard to see where do they fit in and how strong are they? Are they the same? Is it just like prescribing morphine? Is it just like, or is it a whole lot more or a whole lot less? So I tried to make sure I incorporated that in. Um, but it, so it's pretty similar, milligram to milligram. So if you're given um, a total of 30 milligrams a day of morphine, 30 milligrams of hydrocodone, it's going to be about the same equivalency. So hydromorphone, this is one of the things that the hydrocodone metabolizes into. So it's a parent drug, um, and it's metabolized into inactive ingredients. Um, it's oral, IV, sub-Q, IM formulations. So the duration is going to vary a little bit by which, which formulation you're using. Uh, there is an extended release tablet. Um, abuse deterrent, uh, long-acting formulation available, um, four to five times more potent than morphine. Um, and then caution without a renal impairment. You can use it, but do so cautiously. Um, something I'd like to say about the abuse deterrent, I know that the, the pharmaceutical companies like to say, you tout this. It's, it's abuse deterrent. It doesn't do anything necessarily to help with addiction or people developing an addiction or an opioid abuse disorder. So it's just preventing them from crushing it and shooting it, snorting it, whatever they're trying to do. That's, that's the abuse deterrent portion. So it's not really got anything to do with whether it's safer for them to use versus another one as far as developing an opioid use disorder. So oxycodone, um, that one's often paired with um, acetaminophen or you've got your extended release. Um, it is the active parent compound. Um, a very, you know, very number of uh, abuse deterrent strategies or different yeah, formulations of that. Uh, short, long acting, um, three to six or eight to 12. It's about one and a half times as potent as morphine. So it's a little bit stronger. It's probably the medication that got us into the opioid crisis that we're in. Just my opinion. Um, oxymorphone, so that is a breakdown from the oxycodone. Um, active metabolite. It metabolizes into inactive uh, metabolites, uh, available as oral or IV, three or four times more potent than morphine, 10% um, orally bioavailable. It's got a half life of seven to nine hours. Um, that one actually has an immediate release and an extended release. So then to talk about something that's um, and a little bit different, it's still considered an opioid because it does have some new antagonism. Um, central acting analgesic, but it's also got the uh, serotonin norepinephrine, the uh, SNRI properties. So it's, it's kind of a dual function. It does come in an extended release as well as an immediate release, um, metabolized by 2D6. Naloxone is not as effective in reversing this. Um, that if you have somebody overdosing on this, they're probably going to have seizures before they have the um, respiratory depression from it. So it is something that we have to be careful with if they've got a history of seizure disorder, we may not want to use, or we definitely want to be careful about high, how high we put the dose up. So it can go up to uh, 400 milligrams a day, um, comes in 50 milligram tablets, usually dosed every four to six hours, um, one or two tablets, depending upon the, the pain. Um, it's pretty weak compared to morphine um, as far as the, the opioid part of that goes. It's uh, like 0 0.1 to 1. Tapentatol is another in the same class as the uh, tramadol, um, but it's a little bit stronger. Same type of properties as far as the um, uh, analgesia and then the SNRI um, duration of action. There's a short acting and a long acting. Um, the long acting is still a twice a day or metabolized by 2C9. Um, it is uh, 50 to 100 milligrams to start out with every four to six hours. Um, or the extended release, start with a 50 milligram um, twice a day and then see where you, if you need to go up from there. And then fentanyl. 
metabolized by 3A4 to inactive metabolites. So that's a positive thing for renal dysfunction. Onset of analgesia whenever you're using the patch is 12 to 24 hours. Obviously, you do not want to start somebody on a patch because you don't know what they're able to tolerate. It can cause respiratory depression and death. They need to be established on some type of an opioid beforehand. And you will need to have a little bit of cross-titration with that so that they're not completely losing any effect of an opioid before this really has a chance to get absorbed and start working. There are a lot of different oral formulations. There's little suckers. There's buccal tablets. There's sublingual films, usually meant for breakthrough cancer pain. But they do not cross over. So if you've got one and the pharmacy says the insurance won't cover this one, but they'll cover this one, it's not necessarily going to be the same dosage. So it's very important that we are looking at the package inserts, whatever, to make sure that we're not over-prescribing for what the patient can tolerate. They do not, they're not the same as far as absorption and everything. So just be careful about that. With the fentanyl patches, make sure that you tell the patient don't cover it with a heat source, put a heating pad on it. Drug interactions can be fatal. So if you've got a patient on fentanyl, and I'm going to talk about more naloxone later, but we definitely want to get the naloxone prescribed. You're just at more risk any time you're on an extended release product, but definitely with a fentanyl. Naloxone patches recommend, or naloxone nasal spray is recommended. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of an idea, and I took this from the brand name Duragesic, that's one of their information, and there's actually, it goes farther on down than this, but this was just to give you an idea of how many morphine equivalents they should be on to even start on a fentanyl patch. So it kind of gives you a range of what they were on morphine equivalent wise to what you could put them on as a patch to get them started. So methadone, opioid receptor as well as NMD8 antagonist, it's got a very wide variability in its half-life. So depending on when you get to steady state and how it changes with each person, I've seen 7 to 59 hours, and then I've seen another one, quote, 12 to 150. So it's a huge range. So it makes it a little bit trickier to dose and to dose adjust. It slowly releases from the liver and other tissues, which prolongs its action. It may cause problems with QTC prolongation. So anybody that may be at risk or maybe on other QT prolonging medications, recommend an ECG first, and then, you know, maybe follow up after you've got them stable, see how they're doing. Pain relief can wear off before the respiratory depressant activity. So you don't want to dose adjust very fast. In cancer pain, you might try to go up a little bit quicker than you would otherwise. Again, high interpatient variability. So deaths have occurred when converting this one to something or converting on to this one. So be very careful with methadone on this one. Also, monitor the respiratory status and issue naloxone kit with this as well. So some of the takeaway points for the opioids. Immediate release formulations are going to have a peak in one to two hours and a duration of four to six. The extended release peak analgesia in four to six, duration eight to 12. Something to always remind people is that if you're scheduled on an extended release product, it shouldn't be taken as needed because they're not going to get pain relief right after they take it. So it is something that's meant to be taken routinely. It's not a PRN medication. Several opioids are prodrugs, so they have some toxic metabolites. All are metabolized by the liver and with the opioids being excreted renally and can accumulate with renal dysfunction. So with that, what you really want to make sure that you're avoiding if they're very renally compromised is codeine and morphine. The hydromorphone, oxycodone, aparidine, those can be, which I didn't even really talk about that one. It's not used very much anymore, but they can be used, but you really need to use it cautiously. 
actually fentanyl and methadone are going to be the, your safest options in somebody that's got a lot of renal compromise. They're also the ones that are trickier to dose. Um, hepatic impairment, um, all of them are metabolized by the, by the liver, so dysfunction can cause problems with your first pass metabolism, your protein binding, hepatic clearance, so we might have some buildup and need to extend dosing intervals. So again, with this, fentanyl and methadone and hydromorphone are your preferred agents. So just to go back a little bit about um, into the CDC guidelines, uh, what does opioid therapy, what, is it, what does the evidence show? So there's limited research on the effectiveness of long-term therapy for non-end-of-life pain, so non-cancer pain. Um, so evidence is supporting a shorter term use for acute situations. Um, that's where the, the evidence is. Um, there's a lot of a lot of harm that we can do with these um, overdose deaths, um, opioid use disorder. There's a lot of different adverse effects. I didn't even talk about all of those, but there's you've got um, problems with the endocrine system. Um, risk of opioid use disorders can start at any dose. And it, can, it increases in a dose-dependent manner when they develop opioid use disorder. So uh, that's why if we're prescribing these for an acute condition, we need to be limiting the lowest effective dose for the short amounts of time so that we're not giving somebody 60 tablets whenever they probably only need something for a day or so. Um, I, I know that dentists are trying to scale back on how much they are giving um, if anything at all, whenever they're doing some of these procedures, just so they're not out there, so that we don't have um, the medication use bin still enough, which I think this is great that the facility has those. I was very happy to see that when I came in today, um, to be able to get rid of those. Um, so the strategy of escalating the dose to achieve benefit um, just increases the risk, and it's not been shown to improve function. Typically, the higher dose that you're going, you usually have less function, the person feels worse. They not, they're not doing anything because they might be snowed from the medication. So it's not really trying to get something to a pain score of zero um, is really making the patient worse because they're not doing anything anyway. So it's it's even worse than, than having some pain and realizing I'm getting older, I'm going to have some pain, or I'm, I can't obliterate this, I'm going to have some pain. I need to figure out how to function with it. So what potential benefits? Um, modest short-term improvement in pain, possible short-term improvement in function. The risks, um, increases all-cause mortality, risk of unintentional overdose death, um, risk of developing opioid use disorder, uh, worsening sleep disorder, breathing, dizziness, sedation, cognitive dysfunction, um, depression, falls, fractures, motor vehicle, nausea, constipation, dry mouth, um, lots of things that can go wrong with, with using these long term. Um, it's something that I uh, talk about with naloxone when I'm trying to convince a patient that it's okay to take this, that I don't think they're abusing their medication when I'm offering this, is that um, you can be taking your medications as prescribed. I don't think you're abusing them. Um, but you're getting older, so the dose that you've been on for, I've been on this for 20 years, I'm fine, honey. That's, you know, I'm sure I, probably you guys have heard that. Um, but you're 20 years older, now you've got COPD, maybe you've got sleep apnea, and you just really can't wear that, that um, uh, BiPAP machine because it's just really not comfortable, I don't want to wear that. And now it's middle of winter and you've got pneumonia. So you've got a lot of things going on. And then maybe decide to take some NyQuil, and that slows you down a little bit too. And before you know it, then you've got an unintentional overdose. So I try to um, try to put it to them that way and, and talk to them about it. And it's something that I, I think we need to get a lot out there a lot more. But So when might opioid therapy be appropriate? Um, again, the acute pain situation, post-operatively, end of life, that's whenever we need to be considering it, but try to refrain from as much as we can using it just for chronic pain. Uh, try to make sure that we're using a multimodal approach um, and maybe maybe that's when we're using a couple of different things so that we can try if we need an opioid on there that we're doing the lowest dose that we can and use something else to try and, and make sure that we're working. Um, <laughs> reserve the opioids for severe acute pain, immediate release 
You never want to start somebody with a long-acting product whenever they're not opioid tolerant. They need to have the lowest dose that's going to be effective for whatever they've got going on for that acute situation. And then reassess very quickly. Do they need any more? Do we need to just be done with it? We're past that. Now let's move them on to an NSAID. Chronic pain, pain lasting more than three months. So optimize your non-opioid treatments first. Think about the biopsychosocial things that we can do for them. And I know that's a little bit harder because insurance isn't so great about paying for those. And sometimes people don't want to go talk to somebody about cognitive behavioral therapy and learn about pain gating and realize, you know, just sitting there and ruminating is making your pain worse. And so sometimes that takes a little motivation on our part to talk to them about doing things for themselves. But optimize those non-opioid and self-management things. Educating on the treatment options. Make sure that they have realistic expectations of what they can hope to achieve. Evaluate their individual opioid risk factors and establish realistic measurable goals. Before starting an opioid for chronic pain, consider how it would be discontinued if it needs to be, if the benefits are not outweighing the risks or if the pain is not responding to it. Discuss and complete an opioid informed consent together with the patient. Include goals of therapy. And we need to talk about real goals, not just, well, I want to get down to a pain score of two. I think I'd be okay with that. We need to be thinking about function, and that's how we need to approach it. Talking about safe storage and disposal of the medication. There is a crisis. You know, it affects a lot of people. It doesn't just affect, you know, it's not just something for the lower classes. It is everywhere. There is addiction everywhere. And so, you know, just hanging on to those extra pills from surgery because I might need them. That might be your nephew or your grandson comes in and steals those out of your medicine cabinet and overdoses with them or sell them to somebody else on the street. So talk about safe storage. And then use the state prescription drug monitor prior to initiating and then periodically if this is something that you're going to continue on with them. Consider their age, their comorbid conditions before you decide what you're going to prescribe. Anybody that's got, you know, CHF, substance use disorder history, dehydration, compromised renal and hepatic function. These are people that need to have an naloxone kit. And it's like an EpiPen. Hopefully they never have to use it. But we want it out there and we want it, you know, to keep them safe. Initiate a bowel regimen. Avoid combinations that increase the respiratory depression. Benzodiazepines are the Z drugs, the Zolpidem, Zalopan, I can never say those. But your Z drugs, your sleepers. Initiation and dose changes are when somebody is most at risk of having an unintentional overdose. Nobody intends to go out and overdose, but it does happen. And so it's keeping them safe if we're going to be prescribing these. I was afraid I had too much crammed in here, so the end of this presentation is in the best order. So if you're initiating opioids, again, start with immediate release in an opioid-naive patient, shortest duration, and discuss the evidence with the patient that it's really not something that's been shown to show that there's a lot of improvement in function long term. So we need to find other ways. And sometimes there's not. You know, sometimes this is the appropriate thing to do. But we need to have that discussion with the patient about safety. And abuse deterrent formulations, I've already said, it's not any additional safety as far as developing an opioid use disorder. It just makes it harder for somebody to abuse them. Because that is one of the things they do, crush them up, put them in something, inject it, snort it. I remember right after I moved back here from going to pharmacy school, I think there was an overdose death around here where somebody had taken a syringe, drawn out some fentanyl from one of the patches, shot it up, and died. So, I mean, they find ways. When you're continuing opioid therapy, follow up frequently during that initial phase whenever you're trying to find the right dose for them. And make sure that you're looking to see whenever you're following up, how is your function? I know Joint Commission has made it the pain score or the pain scores, but we need to look at that function. Because it's, you know, sometimes whenever you've got somebody that's unfortunately developed that opioid use disorder, their pain score is always going to be high because they're trying to get more medication. 
or it may truly, you know, they may truly still have some pain, but we need to focus on what they're able to do. So that's the real keys. Are you out living in society again the way that you want to? The CDC recommendations, they're recommending very fast follow-up whenever we're having dose changes and then reassessing every three months is what they're recommending and documenting why we need to continue. Components of an opioid regimen, schedule dosing for persistent pain. Pain is easier. Obviously, we all know that to prevent it than to try and treat it once it's gotten out of control. This is something that both CDC and SAMHSA just came out with some new guidelines that I saw yesterday that mimics, going briefly looked at them, but mimics them very much so what the CDC is saying. Your breakthrough pain, shorter acting opioids, you can use the same medication that you're using for the extended release. This is just some additional guidance. The long acting is used 10 to 15 percent of the total daily opioid dose. Short acting, 50 to 100 percent of the original short acting dose, you know, what you're using for your routine. Dosing intervals, you want to think about that based on the duration of the expected duration of activity of the medication. So a sustained release product, you want to be dosing every 8 to 12 hours. The short acting, 4 hours. IV sub Q, that could vary depending upon the medication. And then breakthrough doses are based upon the onset of action, how quickly it's going to be helping you. And titrating doses, again, starting low, going slow. I think everybody was probably taught that. But if you've got a long acting medication on board, you don't want to titrate anything with that too fast. If pain is unmanaged with the current, this is when you would want to titrate it. If the pain is unmanaged with the current regimen, if you're using more than 3 to 4 breakthrough doses per day, then you might want to go up in your standard routine dosing. Once you get the pain stable, if you can, then you can try to get rid of the breakthrough doses and redistribute that. Unstable, then you need to continue to adjust a little bit more. So naloxone, opioid receptor antagonist, it reverses the respiratory depression. Honestly, when the Surgeon General came out and basically almost said everybody ought to have one of these because everybody knows somebody that takes a medication that can cause respiratory depression. So my own personal opinion is if you're prescribing an opioid, you ought to be prescribing in a naloxone kit. From what I've seen in the community, whenever I still work, and I haven't worked in Illinois for a while, I've been working in Kentucky, but what I have seen is that either the patient's not bringing the prescription to the pharmacy or they're not getting one in the first place. I don't know, but I think we should be giving a whole lot more of this than what we are. You want to educate the family if you can. That's the best. Your family, friends, caregivers, if they're not there, still educate the patient. I brought brought show and tell, so besides the actual demo, which I don't, has everybody seen one of these before? If not, I can pass it around. But it's just a single dose. And what comes with this, you can get two in a box, because one may not always be enough. But there's very nice patient education material. So it makes it really easy to read. It's got pictures on there, so it shows them how to use this. So if the patient is the only one there and you're telling them about it, they can still open up the product when they get it home, not take the one out of their actual little container there. But they can still open up the box. It's got two of these in there, and it'll have this. And they can say, my doctor's worried about me. He wants to make sure that you know about this and that you're able to hopefully save my life if I intentionally overdose. So this is what this looks like. So it's just, it's very, very easy to understand. There's nothing to this. The big thing is that you do not want to prime it because there's only one dose in there. So it just gets removed from the package. And then insert it up the nostril comfortably as far as it can go, and then one spray. It does take, what I sent around is the demo, the original demos that they came out with, it was funny, it called it a one-time use, and I was 
talking to my counterpart, and I said, I don't see why it's one-time use. I thought it was just solid, and it wasn't pressing. All of a sudden, it gave way to shot across the room. Luckily, it wasn't pointing at her. So, so it does take a little force because it's like a little ampule in there. So I, I keep the old one so I can show people that. It does take more force than what you guys are seeing. Um, but make sure that they understand after they administer this, call 911. They can put them in the recovery position. Go back to them. You know, if they, there's no response in two to three minutes, they've got a second dose and they can use that. Um, one of the things, if they are using fentanyl, make sure that they understand, you know, you're prescribed this and this stays in the body a long time. If you unintentionally overdose, make sure that your loved one knows to take that patch off before they give that, you know, or you, right after whatever, but they know to take the patch off. The fentanyl and methadone both, are, they're going to require follow-up. Sometimes people think, I'm fine now, I woke up. Well, this is a shorter acting product. It doesn't last that long, 30, 80 to 120 minutes. So that's going to outlast probably the opioid. So they need to get need to get help. They need to call 911. The auto injector, these are probably a little bit pricier. I doubt anybody's going to go out and buy one of these um, without a prescription or a, the, the prescription to cover it. So, but it's, you guys seen these? So it talks to you. As soon as you pull this out, this trainer contains it starts talking. And it's going to tell you exactly what to do. And you pull off this, you press it. I'm not going to let it go through the whole thing. But it it'll, tells you to pull off the tab. It tells you to put it on the thigh, press, hold for five seconds, and it counts it down. Very, very simple to use. Um, I don't know if... These are still out there. These were one of the first things we were using before the little um, uh, Narcans like this came out. But we had these things, and you had to put these together. And I can only only picture somebody if, if you know their husband unintentionally overdosed and then trying to put this together. Like they are still out there. They're probably cheaper, but you have to pop this off, this on. And then you've not got enough. Down here, you pop off, take that off, one piece, pop that in there, and then. Well, this takes a little bit more. And if you think about, not a big for somebody that's a medical professional, but somebody that you know isn't and sees their loved one there not breathing and would have to well, so, you know, it, it's out there. It's cheaper, but it's. Um, a lot there and cheaper, but it's, uh, you know, the, the sink dot is so much easier to use. So I wanted to show you what all was out there. Um, I think I've been on this already. Are we doing on time? I could probably stop here if we need to have yeah. questions because yeah. I, 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 I knew I had too much. So um, I, that's why I wanted to get the naloxone in where I did because I'm pretty. Feel pretty passionately about that. We need to get more of these out there in the community. So, questions? I wondered if um, methadone to morphine was still like ten to one. On the it is. Um, oh, let's see. There we go. So that was the next slide. So, and repeat the question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. She asked what methadone conversion was to morphine. This is this is one one conversion table. You will see different ones. Not every, it's, it's not agreed upon, and methadone is probably the trickiest as far as converting. And that's why I said that if you're converting to methadone, that's where more deaths have occurred. So it's whenever you are titrating or, or trying to cross doses, you're better off to um, look and see what the morphine equivalents are, and then you may go down 10, 25 percent, maybe even 50 percent, because they, if you're titrating because you've got the person's just not responding anymore, so you're rotating. Um, it, maybe they're going to be more sensitive to the other medication. Um, and then methadone, just because it's methadone and it's, it can, you know, it, it takes some skill to work with and not everybody's comfortable with it. So, yeah, it's I've, I've seen three, I've seen higher. So, good question. So, this may be a little bit different because you're primarily based in Kentucky now. Um, but... Do you have any idea about the cost and the coverage for the intranasal naloxone? I do not. I was trying to find something actually real quick before I came over. I, I still live up here. I just 
they haven't had hours for me in Illinois. Anyway, but the um, I I read something, and this was from May. That was, and I think it was just actually in the Washington Post or something that was saying it was like $125 maybe for the it, for somebody to buy it outright. Um, and I don't know about insurance coverage because unfortunately I've not had anybody present a prescription for me to uh, see what the copays are and you know if that's going to be different. So is Kentucky also a state where pharmacists are able to write prescriptions? Yes, I think they might have been even before Illinois. So, is there any burden on the um, the the pharmacy provider in in making that prescription to provide or document this education, or is it purely a I can write this for you because I want you to have it, and just having it is better than nothing? And they have the question. I'm sorry, she's asking about um, the. Um, how easy it is to get the uh, naloxone at a, at a retail pharmacy and the documentation required. I don't know because I've never dispensed any. I know Kentucky requires training. Illinois, I don't think, requires any specific training. Um, and I haven't had anybody. I've, I've looked at the process, but it's been a while for my specific you know, retail store that I still work at. I don't think there's additional documentation, um, so I don't think it would be that burdensome. I think it would probably be just like we do the flu shots. I think that it's the, um, you know, somebody within the public health has said, okay, my name goes on for, and then you can put it in as a prescription. So that's my understanding, but I'm, I'm kind of going by to see my pants on that one. So I don't really know, but I do not think there's any documentation required for the counseling. Um, so and there are uh, free community trainings Yes, throughout the community that people can get it for free and just go through quick training. And then we're also looking into with the grant that we have through um, DHS at providing it to local law enforcement for free at their departments. And we have had some um, departments that are willing to have it there. If a family member comes and wants to get uh, doses, they can get trained and take it with them. Now, not all are going to do that, but we have a few that have expressed interest. Um, but those community trainings, we have had, there's another one coming up on the 20, wait, this week, right? 21st, there's one. Can you guys hear this? In Southern mm -hmm. Illinois, in mm -hmm. Franklin County, where uh, people will get to um, get trained in the lock zone. But if family members are interested, there's a person they can call um, who is doing it for all community members in Southern Illinois through Egyptian Health Department. And they cover the lower, like 30 some counties. Awesome. I had a question. This is a little bit of a devil's advocate question. Okay. Because I get these questions a lot. Um, we're, you know, we're basing a lot of our movement away from opioid use disorder on the significant risks mm -hmm. and the lack of long-term efficacy data. So I think the risks speak for themselves, but do we have any of the long-term efficacy data on alternate treatments like duoxetine, SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants? So the question was uh, the, the risks of the opioids and the long-term efficacy and then the alternate therapies as far as the, the long-term efficacy. And I don't know that we do as much for the medications um, as we do for probably some of the non-medication therapies like the yoga and tai chi um, as far as the long-term benefits. But that is a good question that I probably need to research a little more. So I think we've got pretty reasonable long-term efficacy data on things like NSAIDs and acetaminophen, right. but you just run into so many patients that say, oh, I've tried all that, mm -hmm. and none of it ever worked. And right. So just scripting the conversation with the patient, um, you know, it'd be nice to say, hey, this is just this is just as good mm -hmm. and not as risky, so right. this is what we're doing. Right. And I think part of that is, is um, it's, it's very hard, and I'm not the one prescribing. You know, you guys are, but it is very hard to um, try to reorient the, the the conversation away from a pill may not be your best bet. You know, what if there's something else? And um, trying to get them to agree to try some of these alternate therapies, especially when insurances don't cover it, 
feels it a whole lot easier to write a prescription um, and try to find that kind of thing in the community for free. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, or they sometimes can afford a gym membership to go someplace that offers senior classes. Um, you know, so it, it is, it's a lot harder. So I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be insurance reform to go along with us at some point because that's what we really need. Um, it just puts us in a bind in the meantime to recommend these things and not, you know, have, have them have a way to pay for it. You guys have anything out in the areas? Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody coming.